Thank you, Leanne. Hey, welcome everybody. Um, again, Jane Hoagland with Y Senior Virtual Connect. We are here with Dr. Amy Fletcher from Thrive Center for Personalized Wellness and Healthcare, or Healthcare and Wellness. And um, Dr. Fletcher is here to talk to us a little bit um, about COVID-19 and about how you can approach that, things that are coming up, and a little bit about the vaccine. So we're going to kind of watch a video and then we'll be able to take questions afterwards. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Fletcher. But we have had at this point in time uh, continued to get significant number of calls and questions and concerns about COVID as expected and thought this would be a good platform to update you and allow you to ask some questions. There are many resources out there that you can peruse uh, for information about COVID, particularly the CDC, Mayo Clinic, John Hopkins. Um, it's, it's in the news. We're all inundated with it. I found it interesting that I did the first talk on COVID uh, back on March 16th. At that point in time on March 1st, we had 76 cases of COVID in the United States and no deaths. 15 days later, when I did the first Facebook talk, uh, we had about 4,000 cases in the US. The stats from uh, this morning's COVID cases certainly are appalling and to no surprise to anyone. Um, the incidence of COVID in Mecklenburg County today is about 16%. Uh, percent. The cases in the United States, as we now are approaching and probably now at 21 million people uh, with over 356,000 people have died. So for those of you who are awaiting herd immunity for this to go away, um, we're, you're gonna be waiting a long time. It's estimated that we need over 200 um, million people to be affected um, to be able to have herd immunity. So we've got some we've got some things to share um, for you um, today and just to update on a few things. And I'll be happy to take some questions. We will also be posting a summary of some recommendations regarding supplements um, that we've been acquiring. Most of these are certainly through the Institute for Functional Medicine, as well as uh, the University of Arizona Integrative Medicine Program. So we will be posting a handout for you about that. Um, I won't go into dosing in detail on these things in depth, um, but there are a number of supplements that can be used if you're exposed, um, but also prior to, because we continue to know that with this virus, there is much uncertainty. Our goal, it's still at this point in time, is to slow the spread. Um, the goal initially was to flatten the curve so that we can mobilize our healthcare forces. At this point in time, all of our hospitals across the country are, are bracing and having some difficulty in some cities keeping up um, and being able to staff these hospitals. We are doing okay here, fortunately, in Mecklenburg County, um, but this is real. We want to continue to slow the spread um, because we know that the distribution of the vaccine is going to take some time. I will go into vaccine distribution briefly. Um, and knowing that the vast majority of you probably listening do not fall into age groups that are going to be part of the initial vaccine phase 1B or 1C, um, then when you will be able to get the vaccination. So just a um, little bit um, summary that we are all certainly aware that there's been a lot of hardship and a lot of loss uh, with COVID. And I think everyone personally has been hit by this virus in some way or form, whether it's your family member or friend, someone you know who's been lost. Um, we know the highest risk people for acquiring difficulty uh, with COVID and the most severe disease are persons with underlying chronic health conditions, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, pulmonary conditions, um, obesity, and certain types of severe autoimmune diseases. And unfortunately, there is certainly some racial disparity as well um, amongst this with the populations that are more strongly hit and affected by COVID-19. A question that we ask here in our practice is you know, where does functional and integrative medicine fit into this whole um, this whole pandemic, um, how can we help you 
optimize your health and that of your loved ones so that you may best prevent um, any type, getting the infection, number one, by preventing spread. Um, best to support your own immune health so that if, in fact, you do get COVID-19, how can you best and most quickly recover? How can you reduce your inflammatory response from the virus? And I think of more um Pressing concern is how can you recover completely from the virus? When I initially looked back at my notes and talked about uh, COVID-19, it was felt that probably 96 to 99% of people would completely recover from the COVID virus. Unfortunately, um, now we're seeing upwards of 10% of people who do not completely recover from the virus and do fall into what we call the long haulers. And this 10% number comes from the University of California, Davis. Um, and that, I think, to me, is more my concern. I think I hope I would do well with the virus. Um, but long term, you know, what are we going to do to help people who are chronically affected um, by COVID? What has it done to their immune system, To particularly to their mitochondria? We feel the virus has some effect on mitochondria and your ability to respond and recover from that. So... There, there's just so much to learn about this. The research is exploding. There is still much uncertainty um, and a lot of research out there that's pending. So things are moving so rapidly and it's very fascinating and easy to get drawn into certain rabbit holes about learning about COVID um, and about this um, reading that I've done. So, you know, the, where do we fit in from a functional medicine perspective about COVID? Um, the prevention phase, um, help, help you in the initially in the infection phase, as far as the, uh, the very severe inflammatory phase, I really see functional integrative medicine as more supportive. This is where we do need to rely on people that are hospitalized on, on drugs, on medication, remdesivir, um, convalescent antibody serum, and some of the more um, aggressive approaches that are used in hospitals. But also with functional integrative medicine, we are, are certainly going to have to um, work together to help people uh, get through the long hauler phase. So there are growing, growing number of people that are, are joining groups and, and gaining research um, about the long hauler part of all this. So um, feel free uh, to ask um, some questions. I'll, I'll try to answer um, them as we go along. So I, I would say the number one thing that we encourage you to do is to continue to focus on preventing the spread of the virus wearing your mask, washing your hands. Um, the vaccine is coming, but the distribution is going to be very, very slow. And, and we've seen some problems with that. And it's going to take a while to get enough people vaccinated to have more herd immunity. Um, the questions we get frequently are calling, number one, I would have to say, you know, where are people getting tested now? Um, that has been a big problem. We, we do have now a, an approved home uh, test. Um, the company, uh, I think I looked that up earlier today. I don't remember if I wrote down the notes about the name of the particular company that's doing it, but it will require a prescription from your doctor to actually get this home test. And with the home test, um, should be about, I think about two months before you can actually get it, maybe a little sooner than that. We are sending folks, if you call our office, um, to the urgent care testing sites through the hospital, um, the Go Health and urgent care facilities that are doing the testing. So that's the problem. We're still having some access to testing. Um, that is that is problematic for people, particularly in other parts of, of the country. Um, but once the home test becomes available, I think that will provide some health help. Um, sorry, the home test company is called Lucira, L-U-C-I-R-A. Um, so we'll hopefully we'll be abreast on that, that we may be able to get you access uh, to um, testing. So um, certainly some questions out there, and I, I know this will come up. Um, it is about these mutations. So yes, we have seen um, particularly the strain that has been now noted in um, Britain. Um, and this is the more, the strain, it's been given a new number on the mutation. Um, and this is the UK variant. It has approximately 23 different mutations on this virus. And what they're looking at in these mutations is mutations on the outer coating. If you think of this virus like a big ball, I meant to bring one in, but it's the little spike proteins on the outside that we're seeing mutations on this. And what they've found with this new mutation is that it has increased 
ability to be spread and transmissibility, higher concentrations in the nasal passages, so more easily spread. There is also one that they have noted um, in Africa as well. The bottom line is that viruses mutate. We know this, we have known this for a very long time. Um, they mutate on their ability to bind, the ability to enter cells, to replicate, to reproduce themselves. So that this is not a new and unexpected uh, concept that we've learned that viruses can mutate if we think about the flu virus, for example. Um, the problem with this is that, um, you know, just sequencing the DNA and uh, of these particular virus patterns and knowing how we can best respond. Um, they are currently plugging tons and tons of money into research on figuring out what is happening with the virus, why it is mutating, um, and what we can do to uh, combat that. It is currently felt by the CDC and the companies that are producing the vaccine that based on the mechanism of action of how the vaccination works, that that should not, at least at this point in time, impact the ability of the vaccine to be effective. So we uh, potentially have a second um, Facebook Live to talk more about vaccines in a few weeks. Um, we may alter that um, depending on kind of information that may come out about the vaccines. Uh, I did want to touch just a little bit about the vaccinations. Um, when we did the first talks on the COVID um, back in March of 2020, we felt that uh, they felt at that point that we were at least a year away from getting a vaccination. Um, we have around the world uh, gone gangbusters on producing vaccines. Never before in history have we plugged so much money into research, uh, which has certainly fueled the speed of which the trials have been run. In the past, phase one, phase two, phase three trials require a lot of funding, um, and these things take quite a bit of time. It is just one factor that has grown to allow us to um, mass produce and quickly come out with this vaccine. So the vaccines are different. Um, it is not a live vaccination. It is based on something called mRNA, which is messenger RNA. Um, messenger RNA vaccines, um, the way that it's best explained about how these things work is you, you get the vaccine and that vaccine is like a, a blueprint that's like taken into the cell, briefly used, um, giving it the information about the proteins that it needs to encode, um, and then it, it goes away. It does not become part of your DNA. It is That is not how it works on a um, chemical level. The um, vaccines, I, the way I heard it described also, is kind of like a sticky note, right? It's just you take it in, it tells you what you need to do, and then it, it, the material uh, just goes away. So that um, is a new type of technology. And we've seen a couple different types of vaccines come out from this. The um, ones currently available are the Moderna vaccine, which is the um, Moderna messenger RNA 1273. Um, and these code for the uh, spike proteins on the outside of the virus. Um, this problem with this one is that this is the vaccine that needs to be kept at the very, very low temperatures. Then we have the Pfizer vaccine. Um, also codes for the spike proteins. And this one is not need to be kept at quite the temperature, um, low temperatures that needed to be with the uh, Moderna vaccination. So these types of vaccines have already begun to be um, distributed in the United States, as you're aware. And vaccinations thus far um, are being given to healthcare workers and people that are in long-term care facilities. And this is kind of the initial phase of vaccinations. If you have um, questions about the timeline of when vaccinations will be distributed, you can find that on the CDC's website. Um, it will be in phases. Um, phase two, the next phase, or what they're calling phase 1B, will be um, other frontline workers um, and then people over the age of 75. And then phase 1C will be um, people 16 to 64 with other chronic health conditions or people 65 to 74 and other essential workers. So again, a lot of discussion is, is going into uh, this about the vaccinations. Um, someone had had a question about um, research on pregnancy and COVID um, long-term. So we have had the pregnancy question asked a few times as a practicing obstetrician for many, many years. The problem we see um, with 
pregnancy really with clinical trials is we don't generally volunteer pregnant women to sign up for clinical trials. So we do not have pregnant women who have gone through the clinical trials of these vaccinations. However, based on how the vaccine works, it is felt uh, that pregnant women should, in theory, do well with the vaccination. And they are recommending that pregnant women obviously discuss with their healthcare provider, but a pregnant woman who also falls into maybe a frontline healthcare worker um, may need to certainly weigh that risk benefit ratio and receive a vaccination. Uh, pregnancy is a state that we know, at least from our experience with influenza, um, as well is that when pregnant women do get these types of illnesses, they tend to um, get sick very quickly and, and can have much more severe disease. So that is certainly a concern that I recall having taken care of with pregnant patients with flu and certainly holds true um, with COVID and, and how, this, how this virus impacts your immune system and your inflammation um, response. So um, pregnancy, um, hopefully we will have some further long-term data on that for people in the future. So. Um, and then I'm just answering another question. Um, does blood type play a role in how it impacts um, how you're affected um, with the COVID? Um, so yes, there were some thoughts about um, the blood type and in fact related to how that virus um, binds to different cells based on the number of like your blood type, whether you're negative or positive also can have variants of how you have different proteins on the outsides of your cells. So there, and we know that with the COVID um, illness, um, that it is, is pro-inflammatory and it is also creates more of an impact on your clotting cascade. So this is the, the blood type thing comes into there, um, into that kind of whole explanation. I think scientifically it's hard to explain that um, briefly, but we do see different outcomes based on people of certain blood types. The bottom line is that uh, regardless of your blood type, it behooves you to do everything that you can um, to support your own immune health and manage any type of chronic diseases that, that you have. So I don't think if you have a higher risk blood type that you should be walking around necessarily more in fear. I would focus on more immune support, nutrition, diet, rest, self-care um, than necessarily thinking so much about your particular um, blood type. So and someone else commented, I can't believe it's almost been a year. I, I do think mentally um, the impact of this virus on us as a community and on us um, as individuals has been massive. Uh, mental health issues have skyrocketed. We see this every day. Um, people feel um, very alone, very challenged um, on a daily basis. And um, isolated, many things, from whether socially, emotionally, that it has been a, a very challenging time for all of us. And that is another thing that we certainly think that from a functional and integrative perspective, um, that there is much to offer um, because what you're getting from the conventional side is really merely a prescription um, most often. Um, and so what other ways can you do to be mindful and to take care of yourself and to support your emotional health is is very important um, because this pandemic and this this is not going away uh, anytime, you know, in the next few months. Um, we certainly hope to see that um, we're changing somewhat the trajectory of what's going on um, with numbers of cases. So in any event. Um, so that was a little bit about the vaccines. I do think that, um, you know, we will learn more and more about the vaccinations as um, we further get into this. The um, vaccine, again, I think the thing to remember, it is not a live vaccination. There are five different types of vaccines, but this particular vaccine is new in that it's based on messenger RNA. Um, and they have studied a significant number of people with vaccines and seen um, very rare reported side effects from the vaccinations um, themselves, more what people report typically with any kind of vaccine, which would be um, redness, irritation at the site. My, um, I've known people who've had the vaccine thus far, and the vast majority of people are, are doing very, very well. There are some recommendations against who should not be vaccinated. And again, the great source for this, again, is to look at the CDC website. Um, 
people who've had known anaphylactic reactions um, in the past should have caution. Those people need to be observed longer, certain groups when they get their vaccination. And people who've had a reaction to something called polyethylene glycol, uh, those are the people that we have seen the more severe reported reaction that you may have seen in the news. Um, there's also because of how the vaccine works that some um, discussion that most people with the vaccine, if they're experiencing any type of sort of flare and immune response, whether that's fever, body ache, fever, um, fatigue, that they may notice that more with the second vaccination necessarily than the first. Um, I'm hoping to get my vaccine soon. I think, again, it's a risk benefit ratio to me, the long-term potential of not getting the vaccine. Um, is certainly far greater than my concern of actually potential side effects from getting the vaccine in the first place. So um, that was briefly, you know, a little bit um, certainly about um, the vaccinations. Um, we know that this whole project is called Operation Warp Speed, uh, which is very interesting because it doesn't seem to be moving at a warp speed of progress at this point in time. But hopefully as we uh, get more funding behind this process that this will continue um, and we will be able to see more of our loved ones get access to the vaccinations. So um, I think, um, again, this is meant to be more for questions uh, today. Um, is high blood pressure a factor for getting the vaccine early? Um, we'll need to reference that. I don't believe that they're considering high blood pressure as a factor um, for getting vaccine early, um, but we'll certainly confirm that for you and can reply. Um, it's interesting what percentage of the people that we know that about 60% of people in the United States have some type of chronic illness and only about one in eight of us are metabolically healthy. So it seems to me that uh, the vast percentage of the population does fall into the high risk category um, on some level. So. Um, yes, um, somebody did comment, just to be clear, the vaccine does not attach to your DNA. Correct. It does not. Um, I can post a link to a very um, excellent summary of how the vaccine actually works from the development team at UC Irvine. Um, it was a great kind of interview recording that I watched in I thought it helped simplify it and make a lot of sense from one of the lead scientists. So I can post that link for anybody um, who may be interested in that question. So um, people who already have. So yes, there are a couple different types of vaccinations out there. Um, you know, and I think is one uh, necessarily better than the other. Both have shown very good effectiveness. Um, they both were developed with some of the same type of technology and how they actually are able to get this messenger RNA into the cell with these little uh, lipid kind of molecules. And so the question will be, do you even have a choice? Um, you know, I think wherever you can get access to the vaccination um, at this point in time, I don't really think like as far as me having a choice, I think I either get what I get. So um, that that one will yet to be determined when ultimately, when there's more widespread availability, will you have a choice? Um, for any reason to hold off on shingles vaccination with COVID. So lots, lots of vaccine questions. So we certainly may need to do an additional one about the vaccine. Um, anaphylactic in general. But so um, yes, that's also another question about the vaccine is anaphylactic reaction, exceedingly rare where people get a vaccine. Um, the, the situation with anaphylactic reaction to vaccine is we know how to treat that, right? You have, um, you're observed, um, if people have like the same as with anaphylactic reaction to peanuts, you get EpiPen, you get rapid response and treatment. We are much, much, much better with treating anaphylactic reactions than we are with treating severe COVID. Um, that's, I think, simplistically, I think that's kind of the bottom line that we're much better at, at addressing anaphylactic vaccine reactions. So, um, so a few things about um, the long haulers, because we have seen um, some people here already 
in our practice more and more every week who have been impacted by COVID um, and have not fully recovered. Again, that number is estimated now to be upwards of 10% of people. And those uh, types of symptoms can range from fatigue um, is probably the number one presenting symptom, just like cannot um, get back to the same energy level that they have. They feel in part this is due to the virus's impact on mitochondria. Um, and that is more of what we call your powerhouse of your cell, um, that is some impact on that, as well as potential uh, reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus, which we already do see a number of people with this kind of uh, scenario. Some people will have ongoing loss of taste and smell um, from the virus. It's interesting that there was just a study that Dr. Greenapple forwarded to me from the Journal of Otolaryng Otolaryngology, which is basically eye, ears and eye, ear, nose, and throat doctors, um, looking at COVID vaccinations. I mean, sorry, long haul people with COVID and persistent loss of taste and smell and the role of acupuncture in improving and, and getting those types of your sensations back. Um, because right now we don't really have a medication that's going to do that. So it's more of a wait and see. Um, and certainly we're using a lot of nutraceuticals, but acupuncture is emerging as something potentially that may play a big role um, with helping folks with long haul COVID symptoms. Um, we know that there is also research going on for the long haulers, looking at the role of your immune system, your microbiome, other kind of outside uh, toxin effects. The other thing that's somewhat interesting about the long haul COVID kind of grouping is that they share a lot of similarities with something called POTS, as well as with um, chronic fatigue syndrome. So what we do hope is that maybe this will spur, again, further research into uh, giving further insight to those groups of people as well. We know that um, the, the long-term implications of the virus um, are, are not really best ad addressed some necessarily with medications. And so what we're looking at for supporting recovery in those types of patients at this point in time is certainly nutrition, um, supplements, nutraceuticals, uh, self-care, the things that you hear us preach so, so regularly here at Thrive. Um, some of the top things um, that are being used um, for recovery, whether you're a long hauler or someone who has just recently uh, acquired COVID and you call our office. Um, number one is interesting, the role of melatonin. That's being shown. Uh, melatonin is really, um, it addresses um, many factors. Um, certainly it works as an anti-inflammatory. Um, it works as antiviral, it's immune boosting. And melatonin is one thing that's emerging as a, a big thing to add in if you do acquire COVID and are symptomatic. So dosage is anywhere from five up to 20 milligrams, which I think would be a lot for me, but if I had COVID, I probably wouldn't be going to work and I would probably be very tired anyway. So um, we do look a lot at melatonin is emerging as a big one, uh, resveratrol, um, because of the role of resveratrol in modulating what we call this inflammasome or this immune kind of um, over, overwhelming immune response that happens when like your immune system's like essentially set on fire and over responding. So we know that resveratrol can modulate or can dampen that response. Um, vitamin C is also, again, very good for immune function. Vitamin C taking one to two grams. Um, vitamin D has been studied in, studied in clinical trials. Um, people who are deficient in vitamin D tend to respond um, more poorly um, to the virus if, in fact, that they do acquire it. Um, vitamin D is very helpful for boosting immune function. So in people who are exposed uh, to COVID, test positive, we are recommending that people take 10,000 units a day for two weeks of vitamin D just for that period of time. If you have not had your vitamin D level checked and you are seeing your provider soon, I would recommend that you have that level checked. Um, and then another supplement that's been used a lot, I did do a brief talk on this before, which was on um, N-acetylcysteine, which is commonly known as NAC. NAC is very interesting because it has been, initially was used, when I first learned about it, NAC was used to treatment for Tylenol overdose. Um, so it plays a big role in detoxification. We also know that NAC um, can help um, support viral immune response. 
So NAC is a very interesting supplement. It's easily tolerated. It also helps to thin um, mucus production. So NAC dosing 600 to 900 milligrams uh, twice daily uh, can be very helpful. So these are probably the top supplements that we do recommend that people take um, for post-exposure. Um, some rule of some of these also with prevention. And we will, we will put this out for you as an attached handout so that you will have access to this. Um, and knowing, you know, also certainly sleep and recovery and rest are also uh, very important. Let's see if we have any other um, questions. So any risk of the shingles vaccination with the COVID vaccine coming risks of having so close together? I certainly would um, delay those vaccinations um, apart. Uh, the question has also been raised, if you have had COVID, can you still get the vaccination? Um, the answer is yes. However, there's 90 days between the two that they are recommending. We do not know, um, number one, if you've had COVID, how long will you be immune and to what degree of immunity you will have? Um, same thing goes for the, for the vaccination. We do not know at this point in time, in theory, how long you will be have some level of immunity and what degree of protection. We know that they have shown in the trials that people who have received the vaccine do not uh, tend to um, get a sick if in fact exposed. We hope that you have a lessened response, um, but getting the vaccination um, does not eliminate the possibility that if you are exposed, you could still be a carrier and transmit that to your loved ones. So this is why we are still recommending that people wear a mask. We've all gotten used to these masks and we get some cute ones now and we, we wear them and we're smart about them. I know we're all getting tired of them. So, um, but wearing a mask is still absolutely critical in preventing the spread. Um, because again, reaching herd immunity is going to take far too long um, to get to 200 million people. That would result in a multitude more deaths in this country. And someone asked, will you send the handout you referenced out to me in the email? So we will get the handouts um, for you as well. So um, how long to let post-COVID? And I think, yes, one of the bigger risks um, that we are seeing, um, certainly with COVID as with any virus, just like the flu, if you get the virus, your immune system is compromised, um, you're at higher risk for developing um, subsequent infections, particularly pneumonia, what we see with COVID, um, significant impact on lung, um, lung scarring, respiratory symptoms, pneumonia, bacterial infections. So if you have COVID and you are developing, you know, ongoing fever, ongoing uh, respiratory symptoms, you may need a chest x-ray, you may need antibiotics. Um, generally speaking, most people clear all of these things within a couple weeks. Um, but I do think that if you have COVID and you're having ongoing symptoms of subsequent infections on top of that, I think it's best to reach out to your provider. Um, the patients that I've had who've been recovering at home who've, who've been sicker have had additional things often and needed to be treated, treated in addition with some antibiotics. Um, so antibiotics are being used um, in the hospital setting. Antivirals are being used, um, remdesivir. Some use of this convalescent antibody serum um, really reserved certainly for more uh, severe cases. Um, I wish I could answer how long till the vaccine is available to everyone. I, I wish uh, that I was here to tell you that Thrive was getting the vaccine next week. Um, but unfortunately, I, you know, I don't really have a timeline on that. Um, we're a little behind, I think, where we should be with vaccine distribution. And hopefully in the next few weeks, we will further be able to share that with you. We have vaccinated a, a large number of healthcare providers in this community, which I think to you as our patients um, should be comforting to know. I think one of the biggest issues we have with the hospital setting is, is having enough staff enough ancillary staff um, to take care of you when you go to the hospital. So um, we're getting there. It's it's a long road. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. And I think that is overwhelming to many people. Um, but hopefully we will be able to um, get vaccines sooner than later. Um, 
What's the best way to keep up with the vaccine distribution protocols? It seems like confusing and conflicting information. I would agree. Um, so yes, uh, vaccine um, distribution protocols are run at this point, Operation Warp Speed, partially by the government. Um, CDC has kept up, I think, with their um, listing of who qualifies. Um, it's political. It's medical. There's a, there's a, there's a lot going into this uh, decision. And I know countries around the world are um, sometimes doing better jobs and sometimes doing not as good jobs. So uh, not to get into politics of any of any of that particularly. Um, but yes, uh, vaccines. And then again, once you get the first vaccine, um, you have to get the second vaccine about um, it's three weeks later. We're not currently vaccinating people under the age of 16, but there are clinical trials that are starting on children, I believe, between the ages of tw 12 and 16. Um, so um, hopefully we'll have um, more information um, about them. So let's see. I don't even know how long we are into this talk. 36 minutes. Um, other questions? Um, please feel free um, to post that, those for us. I'm trying to think about what other little info I had on you um, to share. There's so much, um, you know, so much out there. I think a lot of it is, um, I think just fraught with so much uncertainty. Um, and we are making progress, which I do think I feel more optimistic about it than I felt about COVID, um, you know, back early when it came on, and I think we're making great strides um, in getting there. But I just think there's just so much that we don't, you know, don't really know. Um, we do hope to, um, in addition to posting, you know, some supplement recommendations for you, we, we really would like to get together some form of a group program for people that are experiencing these long haul symptoms. Um, what can you do at this point in time to best support your own health, whether you've had COVID or you have not? I think this is a great time of year to really take uh, inventory of your health, where you can start to make some small changes. We do have our group detox program um, that has started up, but you don't need to join, you know, a group detox program to make some positive changes for your health. So whether that's getting more sleep as a priority, whether that's um, doing some regular exercise, if nothing um, else, you know, cleaning up your diet, even a little bit, eating more fruits and vegetables, eating more nutrients, eat, eating for your, your health that you know you're giving your body the best chance. Um, because I think so much of our, you know, food and um, things that we're putting in our mouths are really food should be your, your best um, medicine, honestly. And that's what we preach here at Thrive. So I think those are the things that you can be doing. Um, you cannot really control when you're going to get the vaccination, but you can control what you're doing to support your health. And if you have particular questions, I mean, reach out to us. We're here to, to help you with that. Um, Lots of leafy greens, I think, is important. Fruits and vegetables, um, taking some of these supplements, as I recommended, I think can be very valuable. And um, certainly modulating stress um, is very, very important. Um, if you're struggling with anxiety, depression amidst the pandemic, reach out to somebody, um, get some help. There's lots of online resources for these things. So I think of those things, um, adopting as, as best of a healthy lifestyle as you can is, is going to be so important um, for you and your family and to lead by example for your children. Um, I think that is also very, very helpful. Uh, let's see, what other little tidbits did we have? Anybody else have any other questions? Oh, let's see. What if people don't go back for the second vaccine? Could it be only about taking half the antibodies? So if someone asked, you know, if you only get the first vaccination and then don't go back for the second for like the booster, you know, I don't, that's a hard one, right? I think I'd have to go back and look at the clinical data from the trials. Um, the, the role of the second vaccination is to to further boost your immune response and to have it as robust as possible. So um, 
I think, yes, yeah, so you, would, you wouldn't be getting quite the benefit if you only took one of, of the vaccinations and didn't go back. Now, if you had a severe reaction, those people are not, if you had the first COVID vaccine and had a severe reaction, I mean, they're not recommending that you have any further uh, vaccinations at this point in time. So, um, so we have that um, question, so. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, so I, I think the rest is just a few questions and um, I just wanted to allow time for you to ask your questions if you had them. I, I do think it's comical that I am wearing the same necklace. So it looks like you're from the same screen. Um, this is kind of funny. So, but I did want to allow time for you to ask questions. I don't, I think if you, you can read the questions if you went on Facebook. So does, um, does anyone have any questions of, about things maybe I presented or weren't answered? I have a question. When was that filmed? So that was filmed like two to three weeks ago. Oh, okay. Cause a lot, you know, now 65 and older, can get the vaccine. Yes. They just changed that. In fact, I had yes. my appointment, for, but it's not till March. The appointments went boom, got taken up really quick. Yes, they did. And I think they, when I filmed that, they were just, they, I don't think they were even doing the 75 grouping. Oh, and really? Older. Okay. I think they had just started and, and then, you know, they get bigger allotments. And I think partially it was like, let's give what we have, like, what are we waiting for? So then they started opening up more appointments, but okay. I think it's, it's, it's good that they are, yes, they are definitely giving to 65 and hopefully soon this will just keep expediting. I mean, I'm certainly hopeful with the change in, in things that happened today that we'll have some more positive um, in vaccine production and distribution. Um, from have you our, had yours so. now? Have you I've had, had the first shot. Did you? Um, did I you did have, have the reaction? first vaccine. I had, I had no, I had nothing. I had no okay. pain. I lifted weights after I had my vaccine. I had, um, and I've really only known people who felt just maybe fever and a little bit of, you know, um, tired. Um, my 80 year old parents had no reactions. So, oh, cool. I've, you know, we're just very hopeful. Yes. So Joyce, in terms of distribution, I did talk to a lot of people in, in class today. We kind of had a discussion about it. Um, I know I feel like Atrium is sort of slowed down on what they're doing, but like um, one of one of our group, Carolyn Cooper, who you might you may or may not know, anyway, she reached out because I think she had a later appointment, like the end of February, and she wasn't happy with that. And then she uh, emailed me the other day and said, like Harris Teeter and Fort Mill got her in yesterday. So <clears throat> I mean, I don't know if if there. What I think is there's new distribution points popping up, like randomly and, and I don't really know how she heard about that one but there but you don't have to be in this county it doesn't matter so um you know kind of that may be something to try but it, you know all of a sudden Harris Teeter and Fort Mill has it and she went from end of February to yesterday to get her first so yeah. if you haven't gotten it and you want to do it sooner I mean keep on the lookout keep talking to people I you know I, I just it seems like it seems a little crazy to me that it's this sporadic distribution, but I guess it's well, very well, my, mine is mine is with Atrium, and then Novant contacted me because my, my doctor's with Novant, and so I just went on to see when that was, and that was later. Yeah. So I'm keeping the one I have. Yeah, and so it's almost like this little jockeying of positions because I think there's other options out there that are popping up, so... Well, yeah. the MECNC.gov, my friend got hers right away. Yeah. That's at Bojangles. Yeah, the, the, yeah, I think that people have had better luck with the, um, like the health department and the government. Right. And they schedule your second uh, vaccine after you get, right when you get your first. Now, Atrium schedules them both right yeah. away. I mean, the hospital systems, they're just waiting for more vaccine, like, you know, they're, they just, they're waiting to get access to more. They, they want to distribute. They are, they have healthcare people that are willing to give the vaccinations, but we're just not getting it as much as we need. So um, we all are just 
trying to help yeah. help your neighbors and your family members help find access if they're having trouble kind of coordinating that. So, so keep your ears open and, you know, like like the social media stuff, when, if I hear of anything else, that these things pop up and it's like, then boom, they're gone. Um, so, and then I guess there's maybe another influx and then it opens up again, but um, yeah. It is uh, crazy. I know they said at the rate we're vaccinating, it'll take nine years to vaccinate the entire world. <laughs> so when we talk, can you, t I mean, um, Dr. Fletcher, talk a little bit about, um, well, like what, and, and maybe this is kind of an unknown and it's just subjective, but, you know, in terms of being safe, going around things, you know, the things that, you know, they initially were concerned about, maybe not so concerned about anymore, like touching things, you know, is, yeah. how do you feel about that? Speak to that based on the current research. I mean, I think based on the current research, we know it's mostly transmitted by, by particles, by air, right? By um, problems we've seen in, in rooms with um, lack of circulation. Um, we know that now the transmission outside is much lower than they originally thought. Um, you know, transmission on contact surfaces is not as much as they had thought. And, the, and again, the, the new mutations in the virus are, are much more um, transmittable and more easily passed with, through nasal passages. So it's all about this little, these little spike proteins on the surface of the virus and how, how that transmit into past someone's mucosal membrane. So I think that's why masking is still so important because of the transmission by, you know, coughing, sneezing, respirations. So would Dr. Fletcher, just a question. I just thought about this when you were talking, would like a neti pot or something help if you use that? To I, I think not. I mean, the size of a virus as compared to a uh, bacteria. I mean, we're talking like microns, like microscopic. So certainly can help to clear secretions, but, but viruses probably. are very, mm -hmm. cont very contagious. So um, I don't think that just like rinsing out with a neti pot multiple times a day is necessarily a, a surefire way to be safe. I was just curious. Yeah. Yeah. I think it can help. So. Well, yeah, I'm uh, sure it probably just, but it can't, doesn't prevent anything is what Sure. You know. Yeah. What's your opinion? I still see a lot of people talking about wanting to wear gloves and wearing gloves around. What's your thought on that? I think hand washing is is first and foremost. I don't fault anyone for wearing gloves, um, but what you find with most people who wear gloves is then they touch their face. I mean, we're just inherently people touch their face, not mm -hmm. even thinking about it. So if you have the gloves on and then you touch your face, you might as well not have had gloves on. You should walk hand washing is first and foremost, so. But for some people, it, it keeps them so they don't touch their face, right? They remember they have the gloves on, so it's a reminder not to touch their face, which is what I've had some people tell me that's why they wear them, huh. so. But, I mean, gloves in the grocery store are not that helpful. I mean, you're touching things people already Every touch. Time, yeah. you still need to, but fomite transmission from contact surfaces is essentially negligible, so. Um, that's why we used to take the groceries from the grocery store and wipe them all down before I put them away. And I mean, I, I don't do that anymore. No, I don't. <laughs> so once we saw more data on that. Oh, oh boy. Uh, yeah, I'm done. It, it gets to you some days. It does. Yes. It does, yes. which it is really why does. I think some days I just want to say, oh, I'm so tired of this. You know, which is why we, you know, try to be well, that's positive why and exercise. And walk, yeah. 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 So I have this. Um, handout that I can pass to Jane um, that just shows kind of current supplement recommendations for people if they in fact get sick that you can share with your friends. Um, some newer things I've come across with since being on a Zoom meeting with some colleagues in integrative medicine across the country about what they're looking at for long haulers, which herbal things they're looking at and success. The acupuncture has been successful. It's very interesting to me. Um, but astrologus, boswellia, and CoQ10 are being used for long haulers. So some uh, big kind of researching area up in Connecticut has been using those. Um, so I'll, I can pass this to Jane, and then yeah. you know we'll be we'll be updating this. I mean it, it's it's an ever evolving situation, um, and we're learning from people around the globe about what helps everyone. So it's it's a big group effort to get everybody. Yeah, well, it does. In place. Right. So in terms of putting off, I guess, 
you, you did mention kind of other vaccine. I mean, I guess flu vaccine or shingles vaccine, just maybe trying to separate those. Yes. I mean, I've, I've researched, I could not find like a set like time. Like it wasn't like, they didn't say like you had to wait exactly 90 days from like the COVID to the shingles, but you know, certainly you want that acute inflammatory immune response from the COVID vaccine or the shingles to calm down, right? You don't want to overload your system. You'd be more likely probably to have more fatigue and fever. But I, I tell people, you know, separate them by a couple months. Like, I don't think, you know, you should get one and then the next week get the shingles vaccine. So mm -hmm. just spacing vaccines out is helpful. And again, if you have had COVID, it's a 90 day wait till you get your vaccination. So um, when I went to get my vaccination, they did ask if you'd had any vaccine in the previous two weeks. So I think that's what the hospital was using, um, was to say they didn't want to give it to you if you'd had like a flu shot or shingles two weeks right. prior. But I would err more on the side of pushing it out a little bit. Great. Anybody else have any more questions for Dr. Fletcher? No. Okay. She could get this thing over with, I'd be happy. But <laughs> yeah, so would I. <laughs> Yes, well, I, you know, I think it's important to just take care of yourself however you can, um, you know, and, and, you, and you know, the night, I mean, there's been so many really enough and think about the good things that I mean, I have been forced to figure out technology that I didn't want to know. And so now I feel a little bit more accomplished in that regard. And, um, and just, you know, and the fact that you do feel, you know, if, if you're not sick and haven't been sick, well, that's great because I think when you do, um, my son came down with, I think it was the flu. We thought it was COVID. He had three COVID tests, but he was really, really sick. And I, it's scary. Once, once that comes into your world, it's frightening. So we, we definitely need to, you know, try to think how grateful we are for the stuff that we do have, you know, wearing the masks and, Things like that is not fun. Um, it's pretty miserable at times. I've learned to like teach in a mask and it's not fun, but it's doable. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, it's just saying you're right. Um, there are, so I think, you know, kind of the mental, you know, the mental fortitude that we can, because we're going to be in this for a while longer. So, um, you know, we just hopefully stay positive and um, hopefully, yeah, I mean, hopefully by, you know, the end of the summer, early fall, I mean, hopefully our children are all back in school and our teachers are all vaccinated and our, you know, our businesses are able to be open. And I think once it starts to move in the positive direction, I think it will be very, you know, keep moving and ticking forward and be very encouraging. We've just got to get this thing off the ground. And yeah. Roll. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, let's, let's hope today's the day that it launches um, and, yes. and, and picks up momentum from here on out, right? Definitely. Uh, Dr. Fletcher, thank you again. Um, I, you know, I can hardly wait till the time so we can come back in and visit and, and eat your guys' delicious food and yeah, learn more from you all. But we appreciate you coming to talk to us. And um, this will be um, anybody who's watching this later on. If uh, Dr. Fletcher will send me that, and you can email me at jane.hoagland at ymca.charlotte. I mean, dot org. Sorry, um, YMC jane.hoagland at ymcacharlotte.org. And I'd be happy to um, share that with you. And um, it's always good to see you and, and have Thrive um, support the why. Thank you. Will you send that list to all of us in an email, the list that Dr. Fletcher is going to give you? Yeah, will you send me, each of you send me an email if you want it. So I okay. make sure I get everybody. <laughs> okay. We're all forgetful from time to time. So just send me an email and remind me and I'll do it to the group. Okay. Well, thank you all. Stay healthy. Thanks. All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate you coming on. I think next week I'm going to do a little fitness class, so maybe you can join me. But check my email on Monday.